Hello, everyone. Welcome to Legacy once again. We are grateful for your time. Uh, this is a very special episode to me. I traveled halfway around the world to get this um, episode. And because of him, I really changed my life. I became a Seventh day Adventist. I stopped eating meat. I started to hold the Sabbath on the Saturday. And a lot of things changed. For the best, all biblical based, entirely Bible based, in fact. So the guest I'm talking about is Professor Dr. Walter Beif. Now he's a famous man. If you go on to Google and you search him, if you don't know who he is, uh, you're going to find millions of views. They also have a channel, their own channel, and uh, that channel is about 15 times as big as Legacy. Whenever they post anything, tens of thousands of people will, will look at it, and about a month later, you'll talk about hundreds of thousands of views. And so when I was in South Africa, a lot of strange things happened, actually. I was supposed to go to Mozambique with my friend, Esbio Fori, who you all know by now, uh, to look at places in Mozambique, because when Rebecca and myself got married first and we met, we always had the idea we would live for, say, six months in one country, my country or wherever I'm happy, and then six months wherever she's happy. And then, of course, came COVID, and uh, we got stuck in uh, in Switzerland. Well, that's where Legacy started. You know the story by now. We, I was angry. I was upset, and I was very frustrated. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what? why am I here? Why am I at this place? I, I, I really am not happy here. I don't like these people, and they don't like me. And they're racist. And they're a lot of other things as well. I mean, you just look at the empty churches and that says everything about Europe you, you need to know. And when you actually go inside the churches and you see the occult signs there, all honoring the sun god, <laughs> then you know what you're dealing with. And for those of you who haven't heard the story yet, one night I had a dream. I was sleeping and I had a dream and the dream said to me, go and speak to the army, speak to the security forces, get their stories. And I remembered the dream, and like all of you, I do have nightmares. Thank God I don't remember all of them. There's two specific ones I always remember. Horrible ones, part of life, seen too much, done too much, been exposed to too much. You know, not complaining, that's life. And uh, I remembered this dream, I even made notes of it. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I... I wish to point out to you that uh, I'm from the police. We don't really like the army that much. <laughs> and what's more is, I don't think the army like the police that much. Um, so there's a bit of a problem here with, with, with following your instructions. But if you're serious about it, let me dream about it again. And so I did. And on the third night, I asked the Lord, let me not dream about it. But at the same time, don't let me forget about it. So I made notes, and I made notes everywhere, so that I don't forget about it. And that night, I did not dream about it. And then I approached Esme for and I said, Skalk, we want thing to write your book anyway. You've got such a good story. You're a legendary Special Forces operator, just a great human being, child of God, a single father taking care of his kids. You know what? Fantastic. Um, let us do your episodes. And Skolk said yes. Yes, therefore he said yes. And then you know what happened. 14 episodes later, I said, yes, yeah, people are complaining, man. We have to do it now in uh, in English as well. And so we switched to English, which was, of course, an interesting thing for us, being both from the Nibia and uh, not that fluent in the English language, to be honest. Uh, but we did it. We wrote the book. The book is there. It's doing very well. It opened all sorts of doors for his view. And that's the magic of legacy. That's where it started. And I always said to myself, we will honor God in our program as we did during our service years. And there's a few people who was annoyed by that. And I, uh, 
I don't care. This is the way it is. It's the way it's going to stay. End of story. You know, the last time we mentioned Walter Weib's name was on the video last year, which got the most people banned. And that was when Nicolene for Malter started talking about the creation. Creation versus evolution. In other words, if you're one of those who think that you are uh, millions of years old and uh, you were not created by God, you were created by some stupid big bang from nothing. A theory created by a Jesuit priest, by the way, just read uh, Oath of Evil, uh, the war on Protestantism, and you will know what I'm talking about. Or even better, go and listen what Walter J. Wife have to say about the story as a professor of science. To open your eyes. But sadly, during that video of Walter, and it is still on, and I would urge you to go and look at that video because it's very, very interesting. Uh, now she explains things also from a scientific view, which you can't argue about. So, so when people get nasty and they make uh, all sorts of comments, nasty comments, and I just ban. Now, the reason why I ban is because from the beginning, I've said to myself, when you come on to Legacy, you're actually honoring us who's listening to you with your story. And at the same time, you are exposing yourself to ridicule. You are exposing yourself to people, you know, these keyboard warriors. I don't allow that type of nonsense on Legacy, and I never will. These people who come to us, who speak to us, you know what, they're decent people. And they are opening themselves to, to attacks. And they trust and they have faith that legacy will take care of it. And you're damn right, we will take care of it. So a word of warning. If you have a problem with what Professor Weiss and myself had to say when we were speaking, Keep your comments for yourself, because if you put them on out on legacy, and I don't like your comment, and it takes me seconds to decide whether I like your comment or not, you're banned. Now, of course, you can come crawling back. You just need to open a new uh, account, and then you come crawling back, do the same, I ban you again. Guys, there's nothing wrong with uh, discussing things, but it must be done in a way which is fair to all, and which is conducive to learning something. In other words, not to start swinging, you know, mud walls and getting personal and attacking people. You can do that on Facebook. Don't try it on Legacy. There's going to be consequences. And with that warning, let me say to you, this was... As far as I'm concerned, the greatest interview I ever had, at the time of my life when I was at uh, Prof's house, I was treated very, very well. And I even went to church. I was baptized. I'm really grateful for that. And my journey is continuing. We also, from the beginning, let me get back to what I said when I started this. When I met Rebecca, we decided we will live six months in one country, six months in another country, or just travel. And our ideas and our plans were being uh, taken over by COVID, which we can't really discuss on the show. But once again, don't look at Prof's videos. You won't find them on YouTube because they're too straightforward. You will have to go to the alternative sites where you can actually discuss things without, you know, Big Brother uh, abusing you. So we're thinking seriously of creating an Africa legacy headquarters. Now that is where we can record inside South Africa or close to South Africa, which is the reason why SFRI and myself were about to go to Mozambique. Now this is a funny story because my time in South Africa was extremely limited. Those of you who actually met me there would have known that every single day I was at a different place recording somebody. And so everything was scheduled and we would have gone to Mozambique in, I think, the last week of April. 
Because I know Mozambique well. I know southern Mozambique very well because I operated there for a few years. I do like the country very much. And I was looking for a place. Because the idea of an Africa legacy headquarters is we have like uh, studios right there, very much like the studios which you will see there in the in the video to come. Professional quality stuff. We invite the people. They come. We have a nice interview. We talk to each other. We have a nice conversation. We spend some time. We can even invite other people to come and listen. In other words, we make it open to all. We make it much easier than what uh, Zoom is right now and, of course, much higher quality videos. And so I got a chance to meet with Professor Weif, but it was in the time that I was going to Mozambique. And I said to myself, man, I'm bothered. I don't know what to do. I, I, I have... I know I have to get to Mozambique. I have to get a place where I can grow my own food because I believe there's a time coming where you will not be able to buy and sell. Bible says so. I believe it. End of story. That time is extremely close. Therefore, you need to set yourself up where you can at least grow your own vegetables and your own chickens if you have to eat meat or eggs, things like that. You have to get self-sufficient. Cannot stress that enough. Again, read Oath of Evil or go and look at people like Walter Wife. They've been warning the world for decades and being attacked by the world for many decades. And so I, I left this to, me, to God. I said, Lord, whatever you will be, I, I have a car, I have fuel, I'll go. And let me tell you, I had all sorts of problems with the cars. I had to return two cars. Uh, I had to rent a new car. It was, it was just one hell of a story all the time. And then I got uh, the chance to go to uh, the office, and I grabbed it with both hands, and we went. The journey there was something out of a nightmare. The road disappeared. It's not there anymore. So I was trying very, very slowly with a poor car, on that horrible road. Then at another stage, when I was actually inside Leidenburg, there's no further road. So the speed box says, okay, go on the pavement. Then you drive on the pavement for about two miles. It's the most amazing thing. Every single obstacle you can believe uh, was thrown to me not to go and see this fellow and record this video. But we did record it. There is another uh, video as well on his channel about me. It's not out yet. Uh, where I to a testimony about my faith. Once again, thank you to all of all of the people at uh, Prof's Place who were involved. I'm really grateful to him. Really grateful for the church, grateful for everyone. So let us see what Professor Weiff has to say, because he's here, because he served in the army. He was a national serviceman one stage in his life. I think it was before Savannah. He was an engineering corps. Um, maybe it was a good troop or a bad troop <laughs> that you will have to decide. Hello Internet, I must tell you that I'm excited today and for once you people will not be able to complain about sound quality or video quality which is a good and a bad thing because you really see me now in, in full HD or even more. You might be frightened but really not. I have a guest here which I really admire, he's changed my life and so many millions of others. Professor Dr. Walter J. Weif. Now there's a lot of you who know that name, a lot of you who don't know that name. And uh, I'm grateful to be with you, with you, Prof. And I really appreciate your time for talking to us. And you're here today at Legacy Conversations because you did actually do your national service. Yes, I did. Yes, if you can tell me about it, so what happened? That uh, when Magnus Malon grabbed you with a normal letter, standard 8? No, it was the normal call-up that was active in those days. And they, I was going to go to university, and I had to decide, you know, how am I going to do this? So I thought, you know, do the, the, the training and get it behind your back, and then you'll only have the camps afterwards. So they called me up, and I ended up in Bethlehem, not the one in Israel, 
but the one in South Africa, and I was in the engineering corps. And uh, yes, received our training. And in those days, I don't know exactly how it goes now, but it was still a pretty tough training. It was, uh, yes, interesting. And uh, I did a little stint on the, on the border in Limpopo, but it was just prior to all uh, the turmoil in South Africa. So, yes, we had interesting experiences. No, sir, I've watched your videos a few times most of them, and I will tell all of you guys, if you haven't watched this man already, we're going to leave links for you. Please go and look at it, because it will change your life. But the one thing which I picked up from you is you had a tough childhood, sir. I believe your mom passed at a very young age, and you had a bit of religious problems as well. You became an atheist. Yes, I became an atheist. By the age of 10, I was basically an atheist. Now, it's amazing what religion can do, and I believe many atheists in the world are atheists, not because of what the Bible says, not because of religion, but because of theology. How people interpret things and how they bring them across. And uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. My mother was Lutheran. And that already, in those days, was a recipe for conflict, because that was prior to 1962. That meant that Vatican II was not in place. There was no liaison between Protestantism and Catholicism. Protestantism said, Catholicism is the Antichrist, and Catholicism said, Protestantism is... Uh, a method gone wrong. So it was a war. And so when my mother got very ill with cancer, and in religious instruction they kept telling me that it was such a pity, seeing that she was a Protestant, that she was going to roast in hell for all eternity. You don't tell a little kid that his mother's going to roast in hell without that having an effect. But the problem is, you don't get angry with the person telling you that, you get angry with the God that they are introducing to you. And so, because this continued over a period of four years, by the age of ten, I was an atheist. I didn't believe in God, because uh, even if he did exist, I would have nothing to do with him. But it must have been tough in those days, sir, because I recall in the African schools, anyway, where I come from, Every single day started with the Lord's Prayer. And of course, the assembly hall on a Monday, you would have uh, God there. I mean, they, they introduced God in the school. So what would you do? Just keep quiet? or? Well, I was, I was in a Lutheran school. Well, basically a Lutheran school. It was the German school. It wasn't actually, let's say, only Lutheran. It was for anybody who was German-speaking. But Germany is divided into Lutherans and Catholics, basically. Well, being a Lutheran school, or a Protestant school, basically, the Catholics had a separate entity, and they were a smaller group. So there was a particular nun that used to come for the religious instruction classes. And for the rest, well, uh, I just went along with the flow. And then, of course, when you end up in the army, in the old army, I can tell you people, if it was anything like the police where I come from, well... You do not miss a church parade, and if you do miss it, or you try to jump over it, there will be serious, serious consequences. So how did you survive that one, sir? I mean, because I would parade, take you to the parade ground, and you have to choose where you're going. As I said, I just went with the flow. Now, uh, you know, having come from this background of constantly having this battle and fighting, I was actually quite rebellious in the army. But I very quickly realized that if you are too rebellious, you end up in big trouble. You end up in DB and you get all kinds of problems. And uh, we had a couple of, of officers that were proud to drill two troops against each other to see who could make the others drop. So it was quite tough. But uh, I, was, I was rebellious, and I would do strange things in the army, like salute with the left hand, but very snappily, so they didn't quite get what was wrong with that, but there was something wrong with it. 
And uh, that's the way I survived. I basically joked my way through and uh, made sure I stayed at least in the middle or above the middle when it came to whatever the drill was so that you wouldn't get into trouble because you were the best or you wouldn't get into trouble because you were the worst. Because in the army you can get into trouble if you are the best too. Because they will put you there and say, why can't you all be like this man over here and that night you get it from everybody else, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a matter of survival. You have to it's, keep in the group. and have uh, to keep in the group, yes. So how was the food? Well, the food wasn't bad in those days. And in those days, I didn't have any qualms as to what I would eat. Anything went. So whatever there was, it was fine. They actually took care of us quite well, except uh, in later years, I was called up to a, a camp. And they took us up to a military exercise, and it started raining. And none of the trucks got through. And so there was no food. And so they prepared some stew or something with some chickens that had gone bad. And uh, the entire camp got what you called in those days in the army, chippo guts, which means a serious attack of diarrhea. And most of the guys actually were carted off to military hospitals, but I somehow survived and went through it. So other than that occasion, the food was good. And also in, on that occasion, uh, because they'd run out, some of the food was actually spoiled. And occasionally you would find <laughs> a little worm in it. And uh, so that wasn't so great. But otherwise, the, I must say, the food was plenty and uh, of the highest standard. Did you ever obtain any rank, sir, or that they kept you as a troopy way all the time? I didn't get a rank there. They, wa they wanted to make me a corporal at one stage, but uh, seeing that I had too many rebellious notes against me, they didn't. So I stayed a troop, but uh, yes. Now, of course, there is something called like your barrack life. And when you're in the barracks, you're being young men, you discuss all sorts of things. I believe in my day it was the Scope magazine, but we won't speak about that anymore. Uh, but there were also a lot of religious people in my platoon as well, and they would actually talk about God, uh, sometimes annoyingly, I, I have to say, ashamedly now, I mean, you should speak about God all the time, because it should flow out of you if, if you really believe. Uh, were you exposed to any of those, those type of people? Yes, you know, if you are in the South African, or if you were in the South African military in those days, um, most of the people that attended were of the Dutch Reform faith, and some of them were, you know, very traditional in what they believed. And me being an atheist, I, I just basically quietly mocked and did my own thing. So uh, that got me into trouble with, with some of them. But by and large, I, I tried to just keep it to myself. And then you left the army, so you became a, a PhD in science. You say sometimes in lies, but I'm sure your research wasn't lies. No, my research I don't think was lies. But uh, the philosophies behind science are often based on inference and nothing better than that. And uh, yes, so I sometimes say I do have a PhD. And uh, I was in zoology but in a specialized field, which is comparative animal physiology. So you, you cover the entire physiological spectrum from the lowest animal all the way through to humanity. And uh, that, of course, is very useful in the medical world because when you do experimentation in the medical world, you don't do the experiments on humans other than in a comparative or in a social study, but you don't, you know, inject all kinds of things into, into humans to see what is going to happen or subject them to something that could be detrimental. So having a knowledge of animal physiology was very useful. So in my later career, I was actually professor in medical bioscience. So my research was of a medical nature. 
and in nutrition in particular. Now may I ask you, sir, today as we speak, I don't know if it was always like that, there seems to be two groups of scientists. One believes in creation, in God, and the other one, well, he believes in Satan as far as I'm concerned. Am I correct, sir, if I, if I make a bold statement like that? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I was in a department that was world-renowned for its evolutionary heritage. I mean, the, the skulls of, of human evolution, they basically went through that stream through my university. And so the professors that were involved were paleontologists of world fame, like Professor Broom, for example. And I was basically trained in, in the evolutionary theory, and I was a staunch evolutionist. I had no time for God whatsoever. And most of my colleagues were all evolutionists, and yet some of them were also churchgoers but social churchgoers. They might even be deacons or elders in the church, but they're staunch evolutionists. They don't believe a word of what it says in Scripture. And so these people actually deny God. I, I think of myself, of Dr. Fauci the other day, saying something, he was testifying, and we'll, we'll find out maybe he was actually trying to tell the truth or not, I doubt it. Uh, but he was talking about so many evolutionist scientists. He used that word, and it triggered me, because I thought immediately yeah. what you were talking. So these people, they don't really believe God created Earth. They, they say it's nonsense. No, and uh, you know, uh, an animal is just a product of chance. And the human animal is just on the top of the chain. So basically, your regard for the beauty and the intricacy is, is lowered to a tremendous extent. I mean, as a scientist, and particularly a biologist, you are confronted with the death of animals all the time. I mean, let's take, let's take a group of students, 400 medical students, for example, and they have to learn about the vascular system and about the organs and the body. They have to do dissections. It's part and parcel of it. Now, if you're going to do dissections, you're going to have an animal to dissect in front of you. It's going to be a rabbit, it's going to be a rat or whatever it is, a frog to get the basics, and then you go to a mammalian creature and you look at the differences. Now, if you have 400 students, then you have 400 frogs, you have 400 fish, you have 400 rabbits, you have 400 rats, you have 400 hamsters, and they are cutting them apart. And later on, you move to cadavers. So you develop a, a, a callousness, cut these animals open, but somebody has to also provide them. And that is often the lecturer in charge. So, you know, you would kill thousands of animals in a year in order to gain the knowledge of the anatomy. And you become callous. And when I discovered that God really existed, and when I had to change my view from evolution to creation and, and really for the first time grasp the magnificence and the intricacy of a human body or an animal's body and how it operates, uh, then it became very hard for me to do something like that. And my experimentation would be based on far higher ethical values than I would have had before. If an animal is just an object and then it becomes a created organism with very special features, the way you're going to deal with that animal is going to be very different. And in fact, my university later made me a one-man ethics committee. <laughs> That was quite a challenging task because then you have to ethically uh, determine what experimentation is actually of ethical value and what is not, what is going to cause unnecessary suffering and pain and what is the outcome. There are a lot of things to, to consider in that, in that realm. Yes, so it really changed my concept. Today, it would be 
virtually impossible for me to kill an animal unless it is for a, a higher good of the animal is suffering or something like that. Uh, I would not kill an animal today anymore. Today anymore. Now you became well known as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Yes. And your videos are everywhere available. And again, I will invite you people to have a look at them before you judge. I certainly looked at them for a couple of years to try and prove you wrong. I wasn't the only one. There's a lot of people who tried that. I failed. I'm glad I failed. What I need to know and to understand, sir, is when, when you look at life, is it possible for you to look at it without a religious aspect? Can you really understand what's happening in the world as far as a human being can do so without understanding that there's God? Well, if you look at the world, what do you see? You see suffering. You see chaos. You see uh, unfairness. You see travesties of justice. And you wonder... Why is the world in such a terrible state? And basically, if you, if you look at the world, if something goes wrong, who gets the blame? It's always God. Even the insurance company will tell you that if something went wrong, it was an act of God. Who said it was an act of God? Couldn't it have been an act of somebody else? Couldn't it have been your own negligence? Or could it have been demonic? So... The world and humanity cannot be separated from a spirituality. There is no group in the human family that doesn't have a spiritual aspect. Atheism is a spiritual aspect. It's the antithesis of theism. So in other words, it is hatred of the God concept. That's a religion, because you've made your own religion then. So... Yes, you cannot separate it, and there is a spiritual aspect, but where do you find truth? And what is truth? Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And then he walked away without getting an answer. Why didn't he wait for an answer? And so my whole life, I believed in this tyrant God and therefore rejected him into a state of non-existence. He didn't exist because a deity like that was too horrendous to imagine. And then I discovered prophecy in the Bible. Actually, someone introduced me to prophecy. And when I started understanding prophecy for the first time, and, and let's, let's put it bluntly, prophecy is history written in advance. So if you have history written in advance, and then you can go and check and see that it actually occurred exactly like that. And then you have the deity in the scriptures saying, see, I tell you ahead of time so that when it does happen, you will believe. Then you start realizing that there is a greater reality that you might not have noticed. And in my own life, being an atheist, doesn't mean that you are non-spiritual or that you don't investigate strange things. And I was always interested in the paranormal. And so I went into the paranormal to try and find out what was happening. And if you become involved in that, if you become involved in seances, you might think, well, this is hocus-pocus and it's all based on lies. But once you get involved in things like a Ouija board, for example, and that glass starts flying, and you know this is, this is paranormal, then you realize there must be something, but you don't know what it is. You can't put your finger on it. But when they start communicating and start talking to you, then you know it is an intellectual entity, a realm that you know nothing about. You can still exclude God. You could say, uh, you know, paranormality is an outflow of your own energies or try and rationalize it. But once you get to the, to the scriptures and you see history written in advance and you see it unfolding and you start getting some answers that you did not expect. For example, once you start finding out who the little horn is in Daniel chapter 7, 
that is so meticulously described that you cannot make a mistake. And then you find the, it in another form in the book of Revelation where you have the beast out of the sea with all the identifying features of the little horn power in chapter 7 of Daniel. And you start getting the correlations, then you realize that there is a war. And the war is against the true identity of God. And once you start understanding that and you start seeing what God says and then you start comparing it to what the religious systems are saying in the world and you find out that the two are totally different, that the world has based its religion on traditions and on mythologies, even Greek mythologies, like... Uh, Natural law, for example, is the very basis of the government of the Roman Catholic Church, for example. Where do you find natural law in the Bible as the basis for your legal way of thinking? Uh, I understand you have a legal background. So it's very important to understand that there's a difference between a theos system where God rules and or theocracy, where God rules, and what we have today, where man rules. Now, if you take the laws and the Bible, they're written on two tables of stone. If you take the laws in a country, like, for example, the white papers, <laughs> the pile goes to the ceiling. Nobody could ever know what is all written in those laws. The simplicity and the the moral excellency of what you find in the one and the total chaos in the other tells you that something has gone wrong. And uh, once you discover what God actually says, what went wrong, then suddenly you realize what's happening in the world. You can put the dots together and start connecting the dots. It becomes a massive puzzle. And you can become so involved in the puzzle that you do not see the trees for the forest or the forest for the trees. But once you start unraveling it and you see the puzzle, and then you see the true picture of God, that he is not that tyrant, that he is actually kind, but he is no pushover. He is justice and mercy. Once you, once you get that connection and you see the justice of God and the mercy of God, then uh, all these differences, these wars, they disappear. There's only one truth. Because what is truth? That's what Pilate asked. The answer is simple. Thy word is truth. Thy law is truth. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Then put it to the test. If it fails, throw it away. If it doesn't fail, keep it. Now that is exactly the problem, because we know that the Bible has been changed. And I have about 56 pages of changes, which I can show to any one of you. If you don't believe me, I'll gladly give you a copy of that. And the one change which is the same, the pattern which we found, is they write Jesus Christ out of the Bible. And then they sometimes try and replace our Savior with Maria. Mary. You know, so I can't even say that word without saying it in a bit of a, I suppose, a bit of a um, nauseous way. Mary. But if you people want to know why I'm reacting like this, you really have to watch what Prof has, has said about it and his research on it. You know, poor Mary, she had no, no part in this. She was just a tool that was used. She was doubtless doubtlessly a, a wonderful person. God chose her for a very specific purpose. But to basically deify her, in a sense, and make her the mediator. You know, in Catholicism, the idea is nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus, but nobody comes to Jesus except through Mary. Whereas Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So this is a very interesting analogy. And in any case, what happens to you when you die? What do the religious systems say and what 
does the Bible say? In fact, uh, even our great, our great uh, reformers, Martin Luther, Tyndall, all of those that actually gave the scriptures in the, in the mother tongues of the nations, uh, they actually believed what the Bible says, but their followers don't believe it anymore. So it's a very fascinating story once you start unraveling the lies. And as you say, the Bibles. There are two streams of manuscripts in the world. And depending on which one you follow, you will have a very different view of uh, what it actually says in the Bible. You have the Alexandrian stream, and then you have the Byzantine stream. And the, uh, the question is, where do we get our Bibles from? And the popular view is that we got it from Rome, from the Roman system, and that the papacy gave us the Bible. Well, if that were true, uh, there would be a serious problem because the Old Testament certainly predates Catholicism. And the New Testament, where were those manuscripts kept? Were they in Rome? No, according to the scriptures themselves, they were in the East. And the first seat of Christianity was Antioch. So that was part of the Church of the East. And later, you know, in the Byzantine era, those manuscripts, those were the ones on which uh, they based their Bibles. And we call that the received text, as opposed to the Alexandrian manuscripts. Now, which ones do you want to believe? Just a comparison between the two will show you that the received text elevates Jesus Christ. And the Alexandrian one, written uh, or changed, in my opinion, by Gnostics, degrades Jesus Christ, basically turns him into a created being. And that is the major problem between the two streams. So if, if we ask what Bibles do we read, then I would say read a Bible that is based on the received text. Uh, there are too many contradictions within the Alexandrian stream. And then they also like to add extraneous books like the Apocrypha, where you get totally, totally ludicrous statements like, uh, you know, you drive demons out with the gallbladder of a fish. That's totally ridiculous. And, and things like that, or Jacob worshipped the top of his staff, which is, which is idolatry. So if you want to read a Bible that uh, is probably... No. If you want to read a Bible that's based on the original manuscripts, my vote goes to the received text. So that in English would be the King James Version. In Germany, it would be the Old Luther version or the Schlachter Bible. In Afrikaans or in Dutch, it would be the old, the old translations and not the new translations. And uh, that is how you determine which one you read. By the way, in Greece, just up until a few years ago even, the Alexandrian versions weren't even in circulation. It was only the Byzantine text that was being used. But that's changed because they want to change it. I want to ask you a question which is very relevant to legacy. In the last year and a half, we lost several free to battalion members before I could get to them and get their stories out for you. Sadly so. We regret the loss. And every week goes past and I know there's some, some of the veterans are dying because we're getting old. I mean, I'm 56 this year, and I'm one of the last ones actually who went. You know, most of you will be older than me. And we know there's a, there's a good chance that death will get you at some stage. Well, there's an excellent chance. It's going to get you all, perhaps, and that's our hope. If Jesus arrives before then, then of course it won't. And we believe we're in the end times, and we're close to that. But, sir, what happens to you after death? I know Martin Luther... Uh, talk about soul sleep. If you in a short few words can just comfort these people that their they friends and they was, was now dead is not suffering in hell. They're not burning physically right now. 
Okay, there are a few words in the Bible which are construed as a continually burning fire such as hell. Now, most religious systems have invented such a system. Some even invented in-between systems uh, of a continually burning hell. It's part of the Catholic tradition. It's part of the Islamic tradition. And it is a, it's a method to instill fear. And uh, so what does the Bible really say about that? Now, the word hell can be from the word hades, which means the grave. Or it could be from the word chiena, which is the fire. Now, both are used in, in the New Testament, in the Greek. In the Old Testament, the word is shoal. And there again, it refers to grave. Now, sometimes they translate it as grave, and sometimes they translate it as hell. And that, obviously, depended on the theology of the translator. So what is it really all about? Well, look at the story of Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. What did he say about Lazarus's state? He said, Lazarus is sleeping. And uh, then he went to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave. He was not upset because he had been taken out of a blissful state like heaven. He just continued his life as he did before. So according to the scripture, uh, they are asleep. If you read the Old Testament and someone died, he said they rested with the fathers. In other words, he went to sleep. So the Bible talks about sleep as the state of death. And Martin Luther uh, was very adamant. He said, it's like going to sleep on a, softer, on a sofa, and then at the second coming, Christ will call, and the dead will rise. So if you take Jesus, for example, what he has to say in uh, John chapter 14, for example. It's a very famous verse. I think everybody should know it. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. And I, when, when I have prepared a place, I will come again so that you can be where I am also. So the being where he is also takes place after he has come again. So at the, at the second coming of Christ, according to the scriptures, there will be a resurrection. There will be a resurrection of the just, and then there is a resurrection of the unjust, of the unrighteous, and those are separate and separate events divided by a period of time which is called the millennium. And blessed and holy are those who are part in the first resurrection. So according to the scriptures, you are asleep until the resurrection. Now if you read uh, Daniel, for example, the last verses in the book of Daniel, you, Daniel, you will go and rest, and you will stand in your lot in the latter days. In other words, that is when you will be resurrected. And Paul says the same thing. He says, not only I, but all who have longed for his appearing, then will they be with God. So that is the picture in the Bible. Now what is this fire business, this hyena? this burning fire that has eternal consequences. Well again you have to look at it in con con again you have to look at it in context because the Bible tells us that the earth will be cleansed with fire. And if you read the book of Revelation there will be a judgment and then it says fire will come out of heaven and consume them. What does that mean? Consume them. If you take the, the book Abadiah, it says they consumed away into smoke. They consumed away. Malachi, they will be ashes under your feet. If you read about what uh, is, is said about the devil himself in Ezekiel 28 and in Isaiah chapter 14, 
it says, never will you be anymore. You will be gone. So it is a fire that comes down, but not a fire in which you are kept alive in order to be punished, but it is a consuming fire that removes everybody that has the spirit of rebellion eventually. But God is very long-suffering and gives people time to make a decision. The consequences of that fire are eternal. I'm glad you say that, sir, because there's a lot of people who wonder about it, what happens after death. I mean, we all think about it. I mean, I don't think there's any of us here who haven't had a mate shot right next to you or you've, you've seen death. I've argued once with people, they said to me, you become a man in the police college where you do six months basic training. I disagree. You become a man and you grow up very quickly when you see your own death. Yeah. Because up to then you haven't realized that your own people can actually die. I mean, we were good guys. How can we die? It's not possible. When I was in the military, during, not during my training, it's, uh, yes, during my training, one of our troops dropped down dead, uh, not from a bullet. But uh, in one of my training camps, uh, one of them died by being accidentally shot by a hand carbine by his best mate. He thought the, uh, the weapon was unarmed, and he went bang, bang, and he killed his friend. That was a rather terrible situation. But, you know, we've been confronted with death quite a lot in our lives, me at least. I was at my mother's side when she died. I was the only one there when my father died. I've seen death, and uh, I've seen other people that have died. And having come from a spiritualistic background where I actually dabbled in these things, I believed that I could speak to them, to these entities. And I actually spoke to some forces, and some of them would uh, pretend to be someone that you knew. Now, the Bible forbids the communication with the dead. It forbids the praying to the dead, which is actually called necromancy. It forbids it. Why? Because in many religious systems, the ancestors are revered. In Catholicism, you have a whole plethora of saints that you can you know, speak to. Now, if the Bible is correct, then these people are asleep if they are dead. And the, and the Bible is very clear on it. No longer will they have any part to play. No part. He is dead. He knoweth nothing. His thoughts perish. These are all quotes from the book of Job, for example, or from uh, the writings of Solomon. The state of the dead is very clearly explained. They come to his grave. He does not know it. They get married. He, they don't know it. The Bible is very clear on those issues. So who are you actually speaking to when you are experiencing these visitations, it's a demonic force masquerading as a force of light. Uh, in one of the seance things that I was there, I actually heard the voice of Cecil John Rhodes. And uh, I don't know if you know his history and his Masonic background and all of these things and how he would explain what a terrible exalted position he had in heaven, you know, higher than Jesus probably. And those are lies. Those are the devil's lies. You can only find the truth in the scripture. You cannot trust your own ears. You cannot trust your own eyes when it comes to spiritualistic manifestations or anything of that nature? It seems to me there's a pattern in the world. It seems to me that certain people, when they reach a certain seniority, whether we be presidents or heads of captains of commerce, we all belong to the same organizations. Freemasons, Knights of Malta, Knights Templar, and I know you made many, many videos on this, and it is fascinating. I will put the links here. Have a look at those things. You'll be shocked out of your mind. And how far must we stretch credibility, sir, before, before it becomes a pattern and you have to wonder what on earth is going on? You know, uh, the poets of old said, all the world's a stage, 
and all the men and women merely actors. And the world is a stage. In actual fact, we are living in a Hollywood horror movie at the moment. And sometimes things seem chaotic. But if the scripture is true, then there is a master puppeteer working behind the scenes. And that what seems is actually that which is not. And Freemasonry has this famous saying to hide everything in plain sight. So they will willfully deceive you in plain sight and then boast about having achieved it. And uh, people listen to the media. The media, by the way, is totally controlled. And uh, if, you, if you look at the strings and, and where all these roads lead to, there's a, there's a common saying which says, all roads lead to Rome. Then you will know where the highest intelligence organizations are and that all others are merely sub, subgroups of one great intelligent organization. And uh, there they have a, a group that is residing under someone who is called a general. Now, general is a military term, right? Yes. And uh, if you want to read about their strategies, then read some of the documentation, the art of war, for example. I mean, every, every general probably has to read the art of war. And the master strategist there is actually an acronym for the Jesuit general. And then you will know how governments and how corporations and how the financial system, how it was all strung together. If you read the book of Revelation, chapter 18, and you see the story of the fall of Babylon. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. She has become a house of demons and every unclean and detestable bird. Come out of her, my people, so that you receive not of her plagues. And then it tells you who are the people that are involved. And you'll see all the ship's captains, in other words, the entire stream of economy. And you being a lawman, will probably know that the world is not really run by the law system that you think it's run by, but it's r rather run by maritime law. Because you are born, right? You are birthed. <laughs> and you come to a birth, and then you have a dock. We could go on forever in, in that line. So the ship's captains, the economies of the world, the merchants of the world, they cry, whoa, whoa, Babylon has fallen. You know, who will buy our merchandise? In other words, if you're not linked into that system, you will not survive. Now, God has a role to play in this. But he said that at some stage he will withdraw his protection and he will let loose the winds. In the past, God still protected humanity to an extent, and you could still have a little private business here and a little private business there and not care about the mega corporations. But eventually, the tentacles of government started infiltrating it. You cannot run a business today unless you conform to certain laws. And whatever those laws are, whether they be social laws or whether they be political laws or whether they be commercial laws, they're all going to affect you. You are no longer in charge like the Tenth Commandment tells you that you have a maidservant and a manservant. In other words, somebody who works for you that you have power over. You don't have that. That power has been taken away and been given to the unions. But who controls the unions? That is the next question. And again, all roads re lead to Rome because that's where they actually started. These are all organizations that at some level are controlled by either the Jesuits or the Knights of Malta and eventually by the Jesuits. The banking system, who controls that? Who owns the Bank of America? Who decides which bank goes down, which bank goes up? Or how do you create uh, cycles of fear 
in order to channel people into particular ways of thinking, Hegelian dialectic, all of these things. And you start finding out, and you read the book of Revelation, and it gives you the blueprint of how it is stuck together. And you realize that the world is run through secret societies, which again are so secret that the very members in them don't know what is going on, except the elite. And they will be part of other lodges and elites, and they part of others. And eventually, if you become someone of note, then uh, they even brag about being Knights of Malta. If you take the political leaders and see how many of them are Knights of Malta, or how many of them belong to the Order of the Bath, and you ask yourself, what the heck is the Order of the Bath? And, uh, I mean... Prince Charles was, and now King Charles was the patron of that. And you go to the Order of the Garter, and you ask yourself, what is the Order of the Garter, and where does that link in? You start doing a little bit of studying, you will see how this is all interconnected, and how everything that you know is a lie. You don't even have nationalities, you don't even have sovereign countries. The corporations, and who runs those corporations, and who really has the say. I mean, we could go on forever once we go down that rabbit hole. So the only, the only thing that I can say is there are two systems, and only two. It's either part of the truth or it's part of the lie. I cannot agree with you more. I know I consider the Jesuit order to be the most malicious organization ever created. And if you people don't believe me, because I know we're discussing things which you probably don't want to hear, but it's in your interest to hear it out. And once again, you can watch all the videos. It's explained in great, great detail, many, many hundreds of hours. But just look at the oath. And I can tell you as a, as a policeman, yeah, we took oath as well. I mean, why was, I remember the, the captain who administrated it made a joke. He said something like, I swear to God I will sleep on duty and I'll do this and that. And I stopped him. I said, sir, I'm not swearing that. But everybody was laughing, you know. A few guys actually did raise their hands and they were about to say that. But I think military people do take an oath very, very seriously. For military people, an oath is not just a thing. They, they live by it. And we've seen it through history. We've seen when Nazi Germany, when uh, they changed the oath to Hitler himself, that caused a lot of problems for the officer corps as well. I think Field Marshal von Manstein, he spoke about it. You can go and read it. It's in some of my books as well. So oath is something very important. Am I correct, sir, if I say to you that the oath of a Jesuit order, and it still exists today, we have evidence, is horrible. It, it is horrible. It, it's, it's no, no normal person will make such an oath and keep it. Keep it. You have to basically sever your soul in order to make an oath like that about how you will eliminate people and what methods you will use. And if you take the Masonic Oaths, I mean, I will rip my tongue out of my mouth, the tongue will be ripped out in the way in which you will be uh, ostracized if you break this oath and what will happen to you. And these are not just blank threats that are made for a joke, otherwise you wouldn't find prominent bankers and Vatican bankers hanging from bridges uh, in certain countries if that was not the case. So these are not idle threats. And uh, if you take uh, some of the things that happened in very recent years, if you take some of the political leaders, some of the presidents of some of the countries, if they oppose the narrative uh, that was being spread over the last few years, they also ended up being assassinated. And there were quite a number of them. And how people disappear, I mean, you coming from the intelligence world will know far more about the details than I do. But the research shows quite clearly that uh, there is a, a small group, and Quigley, Quigley was the professor, the Jesuit professor at Georgetown University. He was the mentor of Bill Clinton, for example. He said there is a small group 
of people, a very small elite group of people that control the world. And then he said, and I am part of them. Now what was he? He was a Jesuit, right? And if you read some of the statements of the old presidents of the United States and uh, some of the very prominent people in the United States, what they wrote and said about the order and its way, then uh, you would think again. I mean, even, even that book written by the Catholic priest, uh, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, just read and find out what happens behind the scenes. And you will realize that this war has been raging. And what is it about? It's about a loss of supremacy and uh, methods to regain that supremacy. And the Bible calls it a healing of the wound. And once that wound is healed, and I believe it is healed, then we will know what this really is all about. The war is about Jesus Christ. And you and I are caught in the crossfire. But that means uh, we have to run toward Jesus for protection. You either run behind Jesus. Martin Luther said that. He said you either hide behind Jesus or you hide behind the devil. Take your choice. Try and make peace between the two or try and reach a compromise between the two and you will be crushed. But the spirit of compromise in the world, of course, is a spirit that has to, according to the political and economic systems, prevail. So you have to have a spirit of cooperation. You have to have a spirit of ecumenism. But you have to sacrifice truth in order to have it. Well, yeah, that's Vatican II. Correct. That was the first overture. No, the problem here is you can't be both. It's not possible, sir. You have to choose. Truth and error are mutually exclusive. So if I have to join hands religiously, let's say, with someone that accepts salvation in Jesus Christ, with someone that rejects it, can two walk together lest they agree? Can I worship with someone who acknowledges the divinity of Christ, for example, and someone who denies the divinity of Christ? Can two walk together and reach a religious agreement? Yes, they can, but they have to sacrifice truth. And they have to find another channel or outlet for their religious experience. So in other words, you have to water religion down to a social experience. Let's say caring for the poor. I'm not saying caring for the poor is wrong. I'm saying if that becomes the focus rather than the preaching of the gospel, then you are not part of the Great Commission. Because the Great Commission is go ye into all the world and preach the, the gospel. And the gospel is good news. It is the plan of salvation put into operation and it revolves around a personage. It doesn't revolve about political or social issues. It's about accepting a personage. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Either that is the biggest lie ever sold to humanity or it is the truth. Study it and find for yourself which one it is. I heard once that somebody explained to me, it might even have been you, that mathematically speaking, if you look at the Bible, the correct Bibles, not the fake Jesuit ones, if you look at that and you see all the things which Jesus had to comply with, to be the Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God, it's mathematically possible that I take some uh, C4 and I blow up a tree, a very big tree in a forest and it blows and it goes up and it comes down and it forms by itself a perfectly working log cabin with um, running water and toilets. That's the chances that Jesus is who he is. Even more than that, because basically you ask the question, how much of the Bible is actually prophecy? 
you know, people will give you a percentage, 10%, 20%, whatever they think it is. Actually, 100% of the Bible is prophecy because the story of salvation is actually written into every single story, even in the lives of the people that have been described. If you take the, David, for example, he's a type of Christ in the Bible, and there is the rebellion against him by his son, which is Absalom. And the way in which that unfolds is a complete copy of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. So that's on the one side. But then you have direct prophecy in the Bible. And you have time prophecies in the Bible. And if you read Daniel chapter 8 and 9, then it tells you exactly when the Messiah would come. The old typologies of the Bible, the sacrificial system, tells you what it's all about. What is the sacrificial lamb stand for? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What does he stand for? What are the issues? What happened with the literal lamb in Old Testament times? What happened with the spiritual lamb, the antitype, the greater reality? Uh, those are all prophecies. But if you, as I say, if you go to the book of Daniel, you have a time prophecy that gives you the exact year when the Messiah would be born. And if you start studying that, then you have to accept what it is. And if you read Isaiah chapter 53, for example, it'll tell you the parameters of how he will be, be uh, crucified, what will happen to him, that he will be crucified between criminals. All of it is there. And how he would operate, where he would come from, all written hundreds of years beforehand, that he would come from Galilee, that he would be born in Bethlehem, all of those have to fall in place. And the probability, as you say, is less than that tree blowing up and creating a cabin with fully functioning toilets and water faucets. Martin Luther translated the book of Daniel first. It was extremely important to the man. Why is that, sir? Well, he said it was absolutely essential for people to know that Christ was coming soon. And the book of Daniel to him was the key to unlock and unravel the book of Revelation. And that's why he felt this has to go out to the world. Because the world has to see that there is a unit. The Old Testament is not something where you take a pair of scissors and sever it from the new. The Old Testament is the gospel in type. The gospel in the New Testament is the gospel in verity. And the two are absolutely linked. You cannot divorce them from each other. And that is a, a travesty that has happened in the religious world. I want to mention a word which some people start throwing up when they hear it. They react most violently, which to me means that it's actually that actually she's got something going for her which is worth reading. Ellen G. White. Now, Ellen G. White sir, is seen as a prophetess in modern times by the Seventh-day Church. Why is that, sir? What, what was the characteristics physically which, which she did, which is also in the Bible, which will tell you what the prophet uh, do when he's, when he's busy with God's work. He doesn't roll around there on the floor like a mad Nigerian or something. Uh, so... So did she comply with all those things there? Did she have like supernatural strength? Well, if you, if you look at the prophets of old, the Bible gives very uh, distinct criteria as to what their function should be, what they would be about, and what the manifestations of a prophet should be. So a prophet has to tell the truth. Whatever the prophet says has to be in harmony with Scripture. That's, a, that's one of the most important criteria that you can get. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. That's Isaiah 8 verse 20. So that is a very important criterion. That which the prophet prophesies must come true. Unless there's a conditional aspect, like for example, Jonah had to go and preach to Nineveh, 
and there was a conditionalist aspect. You will be destroyed unless you repent. So when they repented, they were not destroyed. There's a conditionalist aspect. You have to take that into account. The life of the prophet has to be in harmony with God's word. It cannot be in opposition to God, to the law and to the testimony. They must have God's law in their heart. And then there must be the physical manifestation, which you read about in the book of Daniel where it describes exactly how a prophet goes into vision. There's no breath in him. He stops breathing, yet he speaks. So that speaking is, is of a divine nature. And he falls down and then he's strengthened and gets up and his eyes are open. And all of those manifestations must be present in that particular circumstance. Now, Ellen White had all of those, every single one. And not somewhere in a corner where somebody related this before thousands of people where she was uh, studied and investigated while in a state of vision by medical doctors, by skeptical people. And all of the criteria were fulfilled. Now, to me, even that would not convince me because you know I, I, I am a man that wants to base what I believe on on facts and on reality. I don't want to be influenced by anything that is nefarious. But if it's not in the scripture I don't want to know about it. So the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. Go and read the Bible. Let's say, read portions of the Old Testament and then take a book like Patriarchs and Prophets and read that book and see if the Bible doesn't get new life for you. So it's not the Patriarchs and Prophet book that actually does it for you. The Bible starts doing it for you because you're seeing it with a new light. And then you read Prophets and Kings. And then if you want to know about the great controversy that is happening then go and read the, the book, The Great Controversy. And if you want to know how do you come to Christ, read the book, Steps to Christ, and start reading them, and then compare Scripture with Scripture. Make sure that what is said is right, because the Bible says clearly, test the prophets to see if they are from God. Now, it wouldn't say that if there weren't prophets that would come that need to be tested. Now, there have been many prophets. I mean, Mormonism has its prophets. Uh, Christian science had its prophets. The New Age movement had its prophets. Whether it be Blavatsky or whether it be Alice A. Bailey, believe me, I be I've read them all. Are they in harmony with the law and the testimony? Are they in harmony with the scripture? No. Blavatsky, Alice A. Bailey... They have Lucifer as the son of God. The Bible has the opposite, right? And uh, there, Jehovah is the one who lied. And the devil is the one that told the truth. So those have to be discarded if you want to make the scriptures the norm. And remember, the scriptures verify themselves through prophecy, right? So go and study it and see, is it in harmony? Then take a prophet like uh, Joseph Smith, for example, or Brigham Young, the prophet of the Mormons. Didn't he say the devil told the truth about Godhead? I would not have Mother Eve miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, man can achieve Godhood. Isn't that the voice of the serpent that you read about in Genesis chapter 1? And then you compare all of these prophets and you run through them and you say, well, I'm going to discard them all because they're all not in harmony. And then someone gives you Ellen G. White and everybody starts screaming at you. But they have no problem with Nostradamus. They have no problem with Blavatsky. They have no problem with Alice A. Bailey. In fact, they make it the basis of how the United Nations is to be run. But this one is discarded and thrown away. Well, then I get interested and I want to know, well, what does that one say? And you start taking it and you start reading and you compare scripture with this. And if it matches up 
And light starts shining from the pages of Scripture because Scripture is the norm. This is just the lesser light pointing to the greater light. Then you have to make a decision. Am I accepting it or not? There's no doubt about that. So what we're coming to the end, so I have one last question to you. I've not been a Roman Catholic, but I do understand they have some prayers towards Mary, Hail Mary, and I don't know what else, Mother of God, blah, blah, blah. I can recite that off by heart, yes. Yes, yes and I understand it's very quick, so it's a sum of, of, of hypnosis as well, which is a very bad state to be in, because when something can control you, we, we don't like that type of thing. But sir, uh, would the Seventh-day Adventists ever pray towards Ellen G. White? Absolutely not. <laughs> Why would I do something as ridiculous as that? You shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's what the Bible says. But uh, uh, if I preach about the Bible, for example, and I certainly don't want to exalt myself in any shape or form, and somebody gets a DVD of mine and is shocked, and horrified, and wants to throw it away, then I would say, well, compare it with the Scripture. And if it matches and the Scripture is elevated by it, don't deify me, deify the Scriptures, deify the God of the Scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, as Thomas, the doubting one, said, when Jesus said to him, come here, See my hands and put your hand in my side. He fell down on his knees and he says, My Lord and my God, him only shall you worship. Prof, we're really at the end now, but can we end this with a prayer, please? Yes. Shall I pray? Yes, please. Okay. Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to have the Word of God at our disposal. Help us to read it to study it, to internalize it, to test it, and if it is truth, to buy it and never to sell it. And help all of us who are searching and are pained and distraught about what is happening in the world to find the way of peace, and even in the midst of turmoil, to live and find peace. And you are the way, the truth, and the life, and you are the one that can lead us to this path, path of peace. And bless everyone that has been listening and bring them to your word is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and may God bless you in your efforts to spread, spread the truth. And also to the military men. You know, you're fighting for causes and fighting for for God and country, just make sure that you really are fighting for God.